Would you like to discover powerful ways to drive change in your organization? Would you like to learn about the latest concepts in people strategy, HR effectiveness, and optimization that will help your organization achieve a competitive advantage in your industry? Then HRBP MBA Masterclass with Ron Thomas is for you. With today's uncertain business landscape, HR leaders now play a pivotal role in what some say is a paradigm shift in the industry. This comprehensive three-day program, in-person or virtual, will empower you to embrace a more strategic mindset, enhance your decision-making skills, and help your organization to the next level. To register as a group or individual, email us at info at strategyfocusgroup.com or visit our website at www.strategyfocusgroup.com. Good morning, good evening, depending upon what part of the world you're in. If it's Friday, it's the CEO series where we bring together interesting people, uh, leaders, global leaders, entrepreneurs, innovators, and disruptors. Our guest today is Sri Srinivasan, who is the digital person in the U.S. To give us a quick, a quick background, He's the CEO and co-founder of DigiMentors, a digital, social, and virtual hybrid events consulting firm. He has served as chief digital officer for the City of New York, Museum Metropolitan, Metropolitan Museum of Art, and a journalism professor at Columbia University, full-time professor for 20 plus years. Fast Company named him one of the 100 most creative people in business. And he was named in 2010, 35, the most influential people in social media. In 2014, he was named the world's most influential chief digital officer by the CDO Club. Newsweek has named him as one of the 20 most influential Southeast Asians in the US. That's a lot of heavy, heavy lifting. <laughs> my Welcome. mom, this is, this is the intro that my mom would have loved. I lost oh her God. this year, as you know, Ron, and uh, yes, I know. she uh, loved uh, all of those accolades. Uh, I didn't deserve them, but I did them in part to make her happy. Uh, one yeah. of the times when I uh, took a job I should not have, I took it because of the title, and I learned a 46-year-old man should not take a job to impress his mother. <laughs> I could give you a whole lot of stories on that about my background, but that's another conversation. <laughs> so, you know, walk us through your career from starting out to getting all of those accolades and all of those things that came about as a result of the great work you've been doing because you said you didn't deserve it. Well, th that would not have been bestowed upon you <laughs> if someone did not think that you needed to be awarded or honored in that way. Walk us through that. Oh, well, you're very kind. And I just want to say, how delighted I am to be here with you. Uh, you and I were in my apartment around our dining table uh, yes. just before the pandemic. And then, yes. of course, everything shut down and the world changed. Yeah. And uh, now here we are. The pandemic isn't quite over, but as you know, our attitudes have changed and we have yes. moved on. I was in a, a, a group yesterday where we were all standing taking selfies together and we said we hope the pandemic is done because you know no one was wearing a mask we're all crowded in together but uh, it, you know you were kind enough to ask about uh, about my journey and it's really in some ways I think of you Ron uh, being an American working in Dubai working all over the world you were out of place some of the time you weren't it wasn't a natural place to see you there. Mm -hmm. And you've made an amazing run of it. You have done such great work. You have changed mm -hmm. your customers and your clients' lives and their work. It's so wonderful to see. And my life has this tiny reflection of that. I was a son yeah. of, a, uh, of a diplomat uh, family, and uh, my uh, father was posted in Tokyo. So I was born in Japan. And wow. Uh, he had no problem picking me out in the window. He said, the brown one is mine. And uh, that was, uh, my whole life was like that. Working from an, a group of people who I don't always fit in and then trying yes. to fit in. Yeah. I went to school in seven countries in my first 18 years. Yeah. Uh, that's a lot of movement. That's a lot of uh, changes in 
relationships. It's not trusting that everything is going to be okay because you can't yeah. make long-term plans. So that was sort of my, my you know, if, we, if, you were, if you had me on the couch psychoanalyzing me, that would be the kind of background. My own twins, yeah. who are now 20, grew up yeah. in the same apartment for 18 years. I grew up in seven countries. I think uh, I overdid it and they underdid it. My recommendation for anyone who has children or nieces, nephews, make sure they grow up at least for six months to a year or more in one right. other place. So that yeah. is not just the same, uh, you know, the milieu that they're in nurtures and changes them. And mm. uh, of course, my twins traveled around the world, including to Dubai yes. and yes. India yes. and all I've of that. Those. But it's very different, as you know, to, yeah. to pick yourself up move and plant yourself in a new place. So anyway, so I told my parents when I was 12 that I was going to be a journalist and they started crying immediately because Indian parents don't want journalists. They want no. doctors, <laughs> engineers, lawyers, etc. cetera. And, uh, but I, uh, I, I knew this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a journalist and be in the media. And uh, because of my father's work, we had, I, I grew up in the Soviet Union at the height of the wow. Soviet Union in Moscow. Wow. And I would come home speaking fluent Russian and saying Lenin is God. And eventually we moved to Manhattan and I became a good, you know, moving from becoming a communist, I became a full capitalist. And I started saying John Lenin is God and uh, <laughs> fell in love with, you know, the, the, the life uh, uh, that you can have in America. And many years later, I was blessed to be able to come back, study at Columbia Journalism School, and then stay for 20 years as a professor teaching journalism. Mm. The interesting mm. thing was it was at the start of the internet revolution. I joined in 1993 as a professor, and I watched how the internet came along, how yeah. the web came along, how Google came along, and then blogs, and then social media, and mm. uh, crypto and everything that we've seen. And now we talk about interactive uh, technology. We talked about, we talk about generative AI and what that means. And all of it has been a journey that I've been able to uh, learn from and share with the world. You know how they say in, 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 you know, kind of the, uh, if you're the a very beginning of something, you don't need to know much. You just need to know a little bit more than everybody else. And then everybody catches up with you. And I, Loved my time at Columbia. I uh, learned so much, and I was the chief digital officer of Columbia, working on the future of education. And then I moved from there to the Met Museum to work on the future of culture. Yeah, I remember. And that, then yeah. I went to the city of New York to be the chief digital officer, working on the future of cities and citizens. Mm -hmm. And throughout it all, it's it's been a journey of understanding technology, explaining it to people, and helping folks understand how this affects them. Right now, with all the gener generative AI stuff, and I'm sure you'd like to talk about that at some point, yeah, yeah. people are panicking again. People are exhilarated again. And as with all technology, I like to say, you know, calm down, take a look, and see where it makes sense for you. You don't have to throw out your business plans yeah. right away because something new comes along. And, yeah. uh, and that's where we are. So now I, I have my own... Uh, uh, company. We work, we are a social digital uh, consulting business. We also added hybrid and virtual event production uh, mm -hmm. during the pandemic. And I get to work with some fabulous people and I learn so much every day. Mm. That's amazing. That's an amazing journey. You know, one of the things you mentioned, you said you knew at 12 that you wanted to be a journalist. And, you know, I'm thinking back to young people. You have young people in grad school really don't know what they want to do because they're just following the path that someone else told them. How did you keep, first of all, how did you arrive at the thought of being a journalist at 12, even knowing what that term meant? Uh, I think I learned from Superman, right? Clark Kent was a journalist. Uh, Peter Parker was a journalist in Spider-Man. Uh, okay. Kermit the Frog, if you remember in the old Sesame Street, he had a hat and a rain trench coat. He was a journalist. And uh, so I think I saw what journalism could be in terms of uh, telling people stories. And uh, my dad and my mom would subscribe to a newspaper. And the old days, the New York Times would, you know, a thick New York Times would arrive on Sundays. And my dad would encourage me to read the paper. And I had to write a summary every day of really? what, what, what of one article in the paper. That was my 
assignment at the age of 10 to, uh, he was where he knew I needed to have general knowledge and all of that. So he forced me. Uh, so sometimes I blame, I say, I blame you for this, uh, this career that I have. And uh, there is something magical about print, as you know, where you see the, the newspaper still, you've supported uh, our venture called uh, the New York Times Read Along, where we read the Sunday New York Times like crazy people out loud yeah. on Facebook and Twitter, YouTube and LinkedIn. Yeah. And uh, I got my byline. We lived in Fiji. We went to high school. I went to high school in Fiji and I learned uh, I had an opportunity to work at the local newspaper. And I learned so much about life and people and asking folks questions. Uh, mm. I knew this is what I want to do the rest of my life. I got my first byline at uh, at 16, and I said, this is what I'm going to do the rest of my life. And I would have, frankly, if I didn't have to go to college, I would have avoided that also yeah, uh, because yeah. I knew this is what I wanted to do. Uh, and, of course, the irony of it is that not only did I go to college, I then went to grad school, I became a professor, and yeah. uh, it's it's been, the uh, entire journey has been a blessing. Well, you know, I... When you speak to, I saw a video that you did, you did a TEDx Broadway on getting attention, which I find very, very interesting. Because when you say at 12, I knew what I wanted to do. There were detours, there were roadblocks, but you stayed focused on that. Walk us through the getting attention concept. Yeah, thank you. Uh, by the way, I mean, this is one of the things, one of the many reasons uh, we love you, Ron, is that I love the name of your company. You know, you're, 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 you've got strategy and your focus, right? The focus on strategy is so important. I believe, I'm a big believer in intentionality. I believe that things can happen in your life if you're intentional about them. I'm not talking about magical thinking or conjuring up things, but yeah. there is no, there's nothing in my history or my family's history that says, that my dad, who was born in a house with mud walls and a thatched roof, yeah, would yeah. one day grow up to be an ambassador. Uh, yeah. And his brothers have also done incredible things. And that his son would be, uh, you know, chief digital officer of the Metropolitan Museum of Art or the city of New York. Yeah. And uh, we need to acknowledge that these are not things that I did. It took the village, uh, yeah. uh, as they say, to make that happen. And also that the world with all its problems, America with all its problems, if I, I mean, I'm constantly complaining about America, but it gives you opportunity. It doesn't mean that it happens uh, without luck. It doesn't happen without the elitist uh, hierarchy that exists, that yeah. if you can get in and all of that, that's all true. But at the end of the day, we live in a world where uh, so many unusual things have happened. I just came from London, Ron, and you know that the, uh, there is an Indian, uh, Indian origin prime minister of, yeah, of yeah, Great yeah. Britain. There yeah. is a prime minister of Ireland who is of Indian origin. Yes. The first minister of Scotland is of Pakistani origin. The uh, mayor of London is of Pakistani origin. And again, these are not perfect countries. But yeah. the fact that that can happen tells you that you need a lot of help and a lot of luck to be able to do this. Yeah. yeah. To make everything fall into place. Matter of fact, I'm visiting all those countries, but I'm going to Croatia. But I will be in Pakistan twice, and I will be also be back in Mumbai in a few weeks as soon as we get it worked out. That's amazing. Um, By the way, can I, since I have you on, um, I'm going to turn the tables on you. How do you do all your flying, and how do you do your, your um, you know, your thinking when you're when you're traveling? And by the way, can I have some miles, please? Yeah. I have a bank of miles from all my travel. Um, I use travel time as probably the best time. I love 12 hours on a flight. My flight on Tuesday is back to Dubai. I think it's 13 hours. I love that because I have a stack of reading material. I've got everything uh, set up. I've gone through YouTube. I've done my downloads on educational kind of learning opportunities. It's not so much for you know, normal TV stuff, but I use that as a learning moment for 12 hours to do that. And my travel can be complicated, but I use American Express travel. They handle everything. I give them the parameters of timings and all that, and they handle all of that. One of the things I've learned is that if you're not good at it, don't even bother with it. Because I've gone to the airport and tried to check in this, oh, your flight is not until tomorrow. 
<laughs> what do you do with that? That happened in, I think, uh, Kuala Lumpur. And I ended up canceling that ticket, purchasing another ticket on my own to get home back in Dubai. So you learn as you go along. And that has always worked for me. If, if I'm not good at it, I find someone else to do it. And that way I can focus on the things I need to focus on. Love it. Cool. Cool. So we are talking about the whole digital, you talked about the internet coming in and, and growing up in that era. And now I see everybody's freaking out over the chat GPT and all these kinds of things. I say this thing, just calm down. I use it. I use it every day for situations because it gives me kind of a framework and I don't have to do as much research to do what I have to do. So what do you, when you look at the intersection of all of these kinds of things, so I'm thinking of it as kind of a new internet that's coming about. People are freaking out. What is your advice to organizations, schools, and? You, you, you've seen, Ron, the power of ChatGPT as an example. You've seen what it can do. The amazing part about it is right now, it's the weakest, least capable it will ever be. Mm. It, that blows my mind to think that this is the worst chat GPT we will ever see, right? It's going yeah. to get smarter, more it's powerful, better. bigger uh, in time. It's like there's a there's a internet meme about Bart Simpson complaining that it's the hottest summer he's ever lived in. And Homer Simpson tells him, you mean it's the coldest summer because. that you, you, you had because it's going to get worse and worse and worse. Yeah. So not to laugh about global warming. Sorry, I dropped my headphone, and so that okay. Mother Nature uh, uh, getting mad at me for laughing at global warming. <laughs> is not something about. Yeah, uh, and uh, you know, I wish, by the way, that people would react to global warming and the global crisis the way they'd have to chat GPT. Yeah. Right? People are saying we have to redo everything. Our businesses have to change. Our schools have to change. Why not? About what's going to happen to our planet is going yeah. to slowly yeah. die. And we're not reacting the same way. We're reacting more to chat GPT than we are to the climate crisis. That's another yeah. story. Yeah, but yeah. to your question, yeah. how and why and where do we go from here? The answer is we don't know. But we know, as Ron just said, this is like a new internet. He saw in 95, 96, 97, there's something changing. And that's what's happening now. But you should know that we get, there's a famous quote about how we get things wrong in the short term, but we get yeah. things right in the long term. And that's what we're seeing here, that I think those of us who are saying, calm down, understand this, what does this mean for your business, and where do we go from here? And yeah. it's still so early, right? We're talking about months of gener generative AI yeah. versus, you know, this is not, uh, I, I can tell you that uh, when I was the chief digital officer of Columbia, that was when the MOOCs came along. Do you remember the massive open online courses? Yes. And this is an example of how business, you know, this is a CEO show. So let's talk about CEOs. Uh, uh, Sebastian Thrun, who's a professor at Stanford, taught the first MOOC, his uh, computer science course, on uh, a day in September in 2011 mm -hmm. and had tens of thousands of people attend. By the following June, that's in one academic year, the University of Virginia fired its president because she didn't move fast enough on yeah. MOOCs, on these wow. massive open yeah. online courses. And yeah. you're like, it didn't make any sense that they would overreact, right? Yeah. That's what we do. We overreact. And now you go back 10 years later, where are we with MOOCs? They are an important part of how people get educated. But is it changed everything? No. Right. And this is the same thing with the AI. AI is at a different level, of course. Yeah. And we've been living in it with it for, for some time. But you remember the people who said crypto will change everything immediately. And where are we with that? Right. Yeah. Or or Mr. Mutt, who said we would have, you know, a car could come. You could summon your car in L.A. Your, you could stand in L.A. and summon your yeah. car in from New York and it would drive itself all the way. Uh, yeah. And they said he could do it by 2017, 2018. And where are we now? We're 2023. Yeah. It, we can't do it across, you know, uh, two streets. So let's 
calm down. Let's see if you're a CEO, what does this mean for your business, for your clients, your customers? Not what does it mean for the entire planet? That's the most important thing. The focus on your own people has to be first. My, my thought is around generational, uh, different, generational differences. I look at it from my side, counseling CEOs about the future of work. Work in an office versus work in an environment, work at work, working from home or whatever it is. Some companies are flexible, some companies are not flexible. Everyone was freaking out over, we got to get everybody back into the office. Where all of the younger people, which is the, the vast majority of workforces now, is skewing younger, are saying, this is cool, we can work from any place. Do you see kind of a generational mindset? Because the younger people that when I follow, that I follow, are excited about chat GPT and all these kinds of things, but it's kind of like the leaders, the, the people in the University of Virginia you talked about that got rid of this person because they didn't really understand the concept. It's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to explain uh, 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 this. And, and we, you know, I, where I'm sitting now, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna show you where, where my office is right now. This is my window. I don't know if you can see, you can see uh, that's the East River. We moved, Ron, from where you uh, came to oh, visit really? us. That's the UN right there. Do you see the UN? And yes. Roosevelt Island and uh, Queens. That's what you see there. And uh, why I'm pointing it is I'm looking at Cornell Tech right across, in, on, across the East River uh, in, uh, in, on Roosevelt Island. And I was going to say that, you know, Cornell has been associated, as you know, with Ithaca, New York for yeah, centuries, yeah. right? Uh, and now they have a tech campus in Manhattan, basically. Yeah. And the leadership it took to, to make that happen wasn't just like Cornell said, we're going to do it. It took also New York and Mayor Bloomberg to say, I want to attract a world-class university here. Technion from Israel was a finalist. Stanford was a finalist. All of that. That that that's the way you you know you you have to see where does technology make sense and where does it fit in your company where does the culture adjust to this i used to call the job of chief digital officer should be the chief listening officer listening to trends listening to ideas and bring them back to your bosses and tell them how does this make sense where do we go from here hmm. you know there was some research done by microsoft during covid uh, pre covid covid and they said two of the most important concepts that organizations, leaders specifically, need to do a better job at. One was listening, and what, the other was communicating to the levels inside of an organization. But listening is important because when you look at Apple's situation, they said, I want everybody back to work, and a group of thousands of people signed the notes says, no, we're not going to come back to work on what you said. And they're saying, you're not listening to us. Yeah. yeah that's, uh, I think, you know, we talk about listening to trends outside, overseas. But you're talking about listening internally, listening to your own staff. Your staff knows best. They're the ones who have to build the products. I can give you an example. I, as the chief digital officer at the Met, I had a wonderful team of people who worked on tech with me every day. And... You can imagine everybody would be pitching me new apps uh, for the art and uh, new tools. And like everybody's niece or nephew has an app that they want to sell to the Met, right? So uh, they would keep coming to me. And I realized that it doesn't make sense for me to say, that's a good app. Let's, let's bring it in. Because the company has a workflow. My team has a flow and a way of doing things. So instead of the decision coming from me, we created uh, a council and we gave everybody a Google form and we told them, fill in the form and tell us why we should work with you. And then okay. have my team decide, pick the, pick the winners that they're going to work okay. with rather than coming from the top. And now as a consultant, I work with CEOs and companies all over the world. I, it, you would think the best thing is to come in by the CEO. Sometimes it's much better to come in by the middle management because they yeah. know they need the help. It's not this guy being dropped from the boss onto yeah. me. Yeah. He's my partner. And okay. that's how I look at it. Okay. From that middle 
and working yeah. through from, from that vantage point. So yeah. talk us through your style of leadership and how that has evolved. You talked about teams. You talked about the teams at Columbia, you know, you know, at the uh, at the Met, and the different jobs you've had, sort of C level jobs. Mm -hmm. how, how does she listen? <laughs> Do I listen? Is a good question. And 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 by the way, I think that uh, uh, I benefited uh, greatly from my peers and my former bosses. Right, like it it makes a difference. Uh, the leaders that you have. And I can tell you that uh, I've had, uh, in 30 years of working, I've had two female bosses uh, mm. only. What does that tell you about the world, right? And only one of yeah. them was a CEO. One was a yeah. deputy CEO at the Met, and one was the dean of the journalism school, uh, Joan Connor, and the other was Carrie Barrett at the, New York, uh, at, at the Met. And... The what what you learn uh, you you learn from your best bosses and you learn from your worst bosses, yeah. and uh, so I the style I like to have it doesn't mean it always works is uh, to listen and have the team make decisions have the team uh, come to the right conclusion uh, and just ask questions mm -hmm. and uh, and I'm sorry that's our dog Tara. I know Tara. <laughs> you know Tara. <laughs> this is the world we live in. You, you talk yes. about work, right? Here we are. This is, this is okay. Sort of okay, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, uh, it's cool. Uh, but, but one of the things that I, I try to do with, with our team, and I work with an incredible group of people at DigiMentors who, uh, by the way, the company, our company's name is DigiMentors because my best friend and digital mentor, Andrew Lee, and I started the company, and we believe everybody needs a DG mentor in their lives. Yeah. And we believe we can help any company in any subject, any area in the world, not because we're so great, because the technology is so complicated that okay. people need that help. And we work as coaches and advisors and doers, uh, very much like you, Ron. And uh, so to go back to your question about leadership, uh, the you, you learn so much, for, as I said, from people who did right by you and also who did wrong by you. Uh, and in one case, uh, what I learned from the team, uh, from, from this leader, sorry, is that don't see everything only through one lens, meaning wh so whether it's the bottom line or it's sales or anything else, you should have multiple lenses through which you look at something, multiple vectors. If you only are focused on one thing, you're going to be in deep, deep trouble. Yeah. yeah. I, the concept I use is called surrounding. The nucleus, which is the problem, and you surround that. Who's connected to it? Because exactly what you said, and when you talk through a consulting framework, it is identifying the audience that's going to be impacted. Specifically, workers in my particular case, and, and walking those people, um, you know, through that. So you, you at one time was the professor of journalism, and journalism is is huge in the U.S., the concept of journalism. You see what's going on with Fox News and, you know, it's kind of all over the place, distractive, and, and it's just... So my question to you would be, what advice would you, if you could get back into education from the journalism side, how would you counsel and develop the next level of journalists based on everything you, you're seeing happening now? Well, thank you. And I still am, you know, doing things with professors, teachers. I, I just did a workshop at uh, Columbia's School of International Public Affairs, thinking about uh, increasing, you know, your do-gooders trying to do, do good in the world. It's not enough just to do great work. It has to yeah. be seen. It has to be amplified. It has to reach. And that's what's happened in journalism, right? One of the biggest things that changed in journalism was that you needed to know business of journalism uh, for years. Uh, and by the way, I'll just throw out a fact that might surprise some people that of all the professions in America that require a college degree, journalism has the lowest paid. Uh, so again, of all the professions that need a college degree, it's the yeah. lowest paid. And wow. that affects, as you can imagine, lots of aspects of this. But one of the things we were told growing up is that if you're a journalist, don't worry about the business side. Not only don't worry about it, you shouldn't know anything about it. You know how they say workers should know the means of production and yeah. understand. Yeah. Here, journalists were the only people who had no idea how the business worked. And they weren't told. They were told, don't ask. Because 
in a way, journalism was so successful and made so much money in the old days that as a journalist, I just wrote my article and it went out and millions of people saw it or I did my TV. What has changed now is that the audience is now in power. The audience is in charge and they're deciding what they see, what they do, etc. Ron, to have a show like this 25 years ago, you need to book a studio and get some airtime or be lucky enough to be invited on to a, a major show and you'll get five minutes, 10 minute interview, Larry King, and then you're off, right? Like mm-hmm. now you, Ron, are Larry King and mm-hmm. much better looking and, uh, and better dressed even, even uh, you know, so that's how things have changed. And one of the things I tell CEOs all the time is expertise matters now more than ever. Mm-hmm. It's not, you know, where you are or the products you have, it's expertise. And use your LinkedIn. I know you're huge on LinkedIn. LinkedIn to make sure that people see your work and understand you. People are spending all their time showing off their lives on Instagram and Facebook and whatever. And that's fine. By the way, not everybody has a, such a fabulous life. They're not all drinking all those cocktails. In the yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but, Instead, show off your expertise on Twitter, on LinkedIn, show off what you know. And knowledge is now so important. And that's Mm. why you have ChatGPT, great, but you need smart people who can explain it, who can understand it, who can correct it. I'll give you an example. Uh, I tweeted the other day that uh, I put a New York Magazine article through ChatGPT and I told it to summarize it. So it summarized I don't know, 4,000 words into, you know, like a few, a few hundred words. It did a really good job, except in the first sentence, it said, this is a fictional article yes. when it was obviously nonfiction. So yeah. it got all this stuff right yeah. and got the fundamental wrong. Mm. And we are going to live in a world where we're not going to be able to tell, is that Ron really interviewing me or is that an AI interviewing me? It's going to be almost impossible to tell. It's already hard to tell. So where do we go from here? And we should be worried, but not panicked. Mm. The students that are coming through now, so you talked about understanding the business of the business of journalism. You don't have in a lot of small towns, it's been caught up in buying by conglomerates or owning it. And it's kind of muting the real things that's happening how is that going to be solved? Because you see it every day on the news when you read articles. And one of the other things I say is people don't really read enough across different uh, venues. How are we going to shift that? I mean, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be hard. You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, as a CEO, the thing you want to have is lots of people, lots of viewpoints. And by the way, you also want to have people who say no to you. We know too many CEOs who are surrounded by yes men and just do whatever they want. Nobody tells them there's a problem. What it, number one example is what's happening on Twitter, that Mr. Musk, nobody tells him no. There's nobody left to tell him no. Part of the reason, and you understand this better than uh, most people, is that he has fired so many people and kept back the folks who are on those H-1B visas that need the job, right? So they can't, uh, a, a professor told me a long time ago, you should have an FU fund. You should have a little bit of money saved so that you can say FU to your boss yeah. when he tells you to break the ethics or lie yeah. or do yeah. something. Oh, you I love that. FU. This was the, uh, great. Steve Isaacs from Columbia Journalism School taught me that. And But if you're on an H-1B visa, you you're, you have a family to feed. What are you going to do? You, yeah. you do whatever he says. You say, yes, sir. This is a great idea, sir. Yes, you're wonderful. You know, so that's where we need to listen. We need to have people who will tell us the truth. I know why, Ron, they hire you because you do that. You tell them what they will not hear from other people because they hear all the same things all the time from some folks. And you need those other voices in your head, in your newspaper, in your website, in your app. You should have a whole bunch of different things. I'll tell you that I used to watch um, this guy, uh, Bill O'Reilly. God, I've not said his name in years. I yeah, used to watch it on a regular basis at 8, 8 p.m. And my family would be so mad. Like, why are you watching him? And don't watch him on the TV here. But I watched him to just understand what's going on in America. So those yeah. people who are shocked that Trump happened, yeah. that 
America changed for the worse. If you had been watching Fox News in 99, 2000, 2005, it was all there. All of this is a prediction. And all yeah. of it got worse and worse and worse and worse. Yeah. The framework built up over a period of time. But you, uh, uh, that's another point. People don't read as much. I had my car service yesterday, and I saw a woman sitting inside of the waiting room, and she was reading a book. And I complimented her on that. I said, you know, it's good to see someone reading a book because everyone is on a device. I've gone through, I was in Dubai airport a couple of years ago and I passed the family, uh, husband, wife, two kids, and they were all engrossed in a book. Mm -hmm. And I went over and I just told them, absolutely awesome, read. I love it. I love it. I, I'll tell you that uh, there is something about young people, the very young people today who are different uh, from what we expect. Many of them are reducing their social footprint. Many of them are uh, doing less photography with their phones. They are um, uh, buying Polaroid type cameras uh, and taking pictures that way. Uh, yeah. They're buying vinyl, right? Like, yes. which is, I'm not saying everybody's doing this obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah. but this, yeah. this is the idea that anybody is doing. I went to a vinyl record shop and I walked by by accident in the village the other day and I was, it was packed. It was just yeah. absolutely packed with people of all races, all ages. And it just, I just felt good about it. And now I'm just going to defend people who read on their screens, Ron, that I read my Kindle on my screen. You can do that. So yeah. uh, it doesn't mean that everybody who's on a screen is not reading a book, but the point is important that don't just scroll on your Instagram all day, yeah. find time, read a little bit, uh, and there's so much good stuff to read. In fact, there's too much to read, isn't there? It, it's too much to read. But so now, I mentioned to you about my my flight kind of uh, process. I like to print things out. I take an article and I print it out because I can mark the article up and do what I need to do. And it goes through maybe two, three cycles. I pull thoughts from it. I pull quotes from it, all those kinds of things. So for me, reading is work. It's work related. I don't get into the celebrity stuff and all of that because that doesn't concern me in any way, shape, or form. But I read and I have Google alerts set up on things that are, that are of interest to me because of the work I do. So, mm. so that kind of drives it. So I want to ask you this. What is the mo you talked about the mentors you've had, your company's mm. name, Digital, Digi, Digi Mentors. What is the most important leadership lesson that you've learned throughout your career that you would pass on to your students? Uh, well, thank you. Well, I, I, I'll mention one that I sort of talked about, but very specifically, uh, we hired a new dean at Columbia Journalism School of, uh, decades ago now, uh, when uh, three deans ago, Nick Lemon, uh, who's a, a New Yorker writer, a classic journalist and magazine writer, and just a brilliant uh, a journalist that everybody should look up, Nicholas Lemon, L-E-M-A-N-N. -N. And he came to the J School and uh, for the first two, three months, he just listened. He just went on a listening tour of everybody and just listened and wanted people to uh, tell him things. And, you know, when, when you're a leader, people want you to speak. Yeah. And you say, I'm just listening. And yeah. it just struck me that I'd never seen anything like it. Uh, some people will mistake that for weakness. Some people will mistake that for incompetence. Some people will mistake that for yeah. lack of confidence and ability to do something. But he was so, he, it was never like that. We knew there was something coming. And mm -hmm. another thing that he did for us well, all the time is that, by the way, he had a, his counsel, right? His, his, the people who reported to him was me, uh, an African-American woman and three other women were all in his council. So he went out of his way to hire people who didn't look like him. Uh, mm. That was very important. People like to hire people who look like them, as you know, in the HR business. And he, he did that in a beautiful way. And then the other thing he did was he taught me the power of the one page memo. And what does that mean? That is, you go to him, you pitch him, you tell him, I want to do this, I want to do this. He said, write me a memo. And the act of writing that memo will clarify your thoughts and okay. help. And he's not saying write an essay, right? One mm -hmm. page can be like, you know, two paragraphs. You just write me a memo. 
so he would keep saying that, write me a memo, a one pager, give me a one pager. And you're like, oh, I just told you everything. No, writing it down has a power. And mm. he was really good at that. And the other, the other thing I'm just going to just say what I've watched from the outside. Um, I'm very much interested in, in the NFL. I'm a big fan, despite all the problems yeah. in the NFL and the yeah. violence. Uh, I'm a big fan and student of the Rooney rule which you know is about how you get more minorities yeah. to be head coaches. Yeah. And here's an example of a rule that worked and now doesn't work. Yeah. And the Rooney rule to explain it to people, even if you don't know anything about American football, yeah. it's, it's, it's really simple. It is that you have to interview one minority candidate in order to have a, uh, to your head coaching job. Mm -hmm. And the, at first, people were reluctant because these billionaire owners want to hire somebody they know. And yeah. that's what they did. But what happened over time is that they were, expo they were forced to sit in front. You know, they would sit like this and listen to this, <laughs> this poor African-American yeah. guy who was forced to do this interview. And once in a while, they say, you know, I'm still going to hire the white guy I want. But, you know, he'd be really good for my buddy down in some other place. And yeah. that helped. And by the way, the African-American coaches themselves were opposed to this. They said, yeah. we don't want to be tokens. We don't want to be this. But the process of going through the interview, of preparing right. your playbook, being able to tell your own story. This is what I tell folks who want to be successful. If you can't tell your own story well, if you can't be an advocate for your product, which is you, yeah. how can you be an advocate for my product? How can mm. you tell my story for my tools or whatever it is on my services? So... Mm. What they did was it, it changed dramatically the number of black coaches uh, that were in the NFL. For it, it, at the maximum, it came from the – it's yeah. named after the Rooney family that owns the Pittsburgh right. Steelers. Now, over time, it's gone back down. It's a holy mess. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a problem. But yeah. just I like that concept. And so I brought it to the Met, and I said that in every uh, finalist pool of any hiring we do, there has to be an underrepresented minority. And I'm proud to say we hired the first Hispanic man in our department. We hired the first African-American woman in our department. And not because they were minorities, because they were the best damn people. And you mm -hmm. know that often the best people aren't looking for work, right? Yeah. They're doing their thing. Active. And so, so that's, the, that's how you, that's why you, you, you make, you make the big bucks. You have the better <laughs> outfit. Look at, look at what you're wearing. Look at your this, lighting. And this is only lighting. for the show. You want you don't want to see below. It's this is only for the show. So what you've been talking about, you know, I love the concept of the Rooney Rule. But one of the things you mentioned was that the memo writing, uh, because I know a lot of companies are now moving away from a PowerPoint deck. You got to go through the slides. And I counseled someone the other day. I said, concentrate on your story. Tell the story. Forget it. how many slides should I use. Who cares? Okay. Because they're not going to walk away being aligned to a slide, but they would be aligned to the story that you told behind that. So when you think of people's careers and students, and I, I love the, the, the analogy that you use of being about telling the story of you. Give us some insights because you're a branding expert of how someone that's in the mix of, of trying to figure out next steps. They didn't know that they wanted to be a journalist at 12. And they're <laughs> trying to figure out, maybe they're in law and they don't want to do law. I met a gentleman the other day who was a lawyer and now he's a minister and he's building a church. I'm always amazed by people that make these detours. I don't want to say detours, or maybe a U-turn or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I I had a, a a friend by the way who was running uh, the Asia operations for a major American corporation in out of Singapore, and he wanted to move his family to India. And they said, you know, we move you to India in a heartbeat because we love what you do, but because of the regulations and everything, we have to be the Asia operations have to be in Singapore. If you're willing to take a pay cut and a demotion, you can base your family in India. And you know what? He did it. He hmm. said. The family was more important than, than having the title. The title didn't matter to him. What he yeah. wanted to do was good work and be with his family. And that was so, and this was now 20 years ago, it made such a difference in his life. And also to have someone that senior based in India for at that moment was really good for everybody 
around him. And when you ask about how do you predict things, I can tell you about a woman who was 72 years old when she came to Columbia Journalism School. Our average age is 27. So this woman's the inverse at 72. And I said, tell me your story. Like, how are you here? Why are you here? And she said that her whole life, her only dream was to be a journalist. And she went to the Paris Bureau of Newsweek magazine when it, at its, you know, kind of its heyday of magazines. And the only job she could get was cigarette girl. That was an actual job in the Paris Bureau of Newsweek magazine, because what you do is the, the men are typing and they have the cigarettes yeah. hanging cigarette out in their girl. mouth. Yeah, yeah. And so they're typing. And then these girls, these women yeah. would come with cigarettes, light their cigarettes for them. That was the job. And she said, I was told if I do this well for two years, I can become a secretary wow. at Newsweek. And then maybe 15 years down the line, I can become a, you know, work in the cooking section or whatever. And so she packed up, moved from Paris, moved back home, had a whole life, became a grandmother, had a whole career in something else. And her family and grandchildren, when they heard the story, when they, you know, they knew the story, obviously they said, you got to go back to school, grandma, you got to go do this. And, you know, she worked harder than, and smarter than so many of the young people because she understood what she had missed and appreciated why she was there. And that's why I tell anybody who's unsure or they're struggling or have fallen in any way, I say, you know, it's never too late. And yeah. one of my favorite hashtags is always be learning, learn new things. Like uh, during the pandemic, it was my yeah. job, I felt, to learn the new technology, these virtual events, these kinds yeah. of things you're doing so well. Let's learn together and with so much to learn. That's the, that's the fun part. Cool. One of my afterthoughts that, that when, I, when I do leadership development is I talk through that, that you have to, just because you're a leader and you've been anointed that role, you have to develop as a better leader. So just because you do a leadership offsite once a year, that's not going to do it. What are you reading? Yeah. Who are you talking exactly. to? Who's your mentor? All these kinds of things. And that's what I kind of carry out to people. Folks, I don't know. I want everybody to pay attention here because Ron's dropping the truth bombs like this. Like these are these as are well, things he charges I'm a lot of money. Keep, I'm, I'm just no. trying to keep, keep up. You, you charge a lot of money for this stuff, Ron. You're giving it away right here. Yeah, it's yeah. so cool. This is this is well, this is so important. Well, I'll well, tell you, you an example of this, uh, Ron. That uh, you know, when I teach tech stuff, I I I used to have. A, this is really a long ago. We used to have like a less a website so that people would know how to use the internet. Like we used to, I used to teach people how to use the web, okay, if you can believe that. And yeah. I used to have a handout and I wouldn't put it online because I wanted people who had paid for the class to get it, right? And someone said to me, and I wish I could remember who it was, who said, just give it away. Just give it away because if, if people see that this is what you're giving away, then they'll think that what you charge for is 10 times better because the free stuff... Oh. And yeah. that's what I've done my entire life. I gave it all away and it's come okay. back a million times to yeah. me. And yeah. frankly, yeah. you know what the secret is? That it's the same thing. It's just more time, yeah. more attention, yeah. all of that. It's not yeah. the, 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 the folksy saying that's important. It's implementing it, understanding how to you know, fix it and, and do that. That's the hard part. Wow. Shri, thank you so much for your time this morning. And it was, it was, it's an honor for me, for folks that don't know the concept of the CEO series. It came from Shree's New York Times read along. And I had been following over the years and whatever country I was in, whatever I landed in the country, I said, okay, let, let me do a, a time differential so I know what time it starts if I'm in Hong Kong or wherever it was. So I was always able to, to log in because it was a learning session. So thank you so much for being a, a, a guest on the show. And we'll be in touch. I'll, I'm going to uh, uh, see your brother in a couple of weeks and uh, we'll say hi. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. And good luck with everything, Ron. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you.